Welcome back to the Black Letter Podcast. We set out to create an entertaining and exciting podcast about law and business. Black Letter, the name, comes from the Gothic typeset. Over time, Black Letter became the only font that English law books were printed in. It made it harder for kind of the common person to understand what the English law books said. Black Letter came to represent something that was law, that was set in stone, that was sort of old and a well-settled fundamental principle of law. We're here to demystify black letter law. We're here to demystify things that happen in business and law and where those two meet. And I hope you have fun listening. Welcome back to another episode of the Black Letter Podcast. With me today, once again, I have Jackie Kwan. Jackie and I talked briefly last time about high-performing teams, and we're about to hear, first, what is a high-performing team? And second, what is the secret to a high-performing team? And third, how did you arrive at this secret? And how do we implement it? All of those things. That's a lot of questions. So let's jump right in. Start where you want to start. And I'll I'll, I'll jump in if I, if I get confused. <laughs> so high-performing teams, what does that look like? Um, yeah, what is that? It's a team that helps each other. It's a team that, uh, you know, people are empathic with one another. Um, okay. If a mistake happens, you embrace it. And it's essentially an environment of psychological safety. And so very much so, um, in our work environment, when stress goes up, the happiness research says empathy goes down. So stress. Right. So people- like the TV show Suits, yeah. right? Like have you, I, I don't watch Suits. I think it's ridiculous. I don't know how any law firm could live like that. My daughter watches it, but I can't imagine every time there's a stressful situation, everybody gets mad at each other and they yell and there's like, we're going to fire you. So I assume that's, they're not a high performing team. Is that right? No, no, okay. it's the opposite. That's exactly okay. right. It's actually a toxic team and it's actually very hurtful. So Amy Edmonds said, yes, Amy Edmonds in the Harvard Business School Leadership Professor, she wrote a book called the Fearless Organization. And it talks about um, organizations that thrive and organizations that had catastrophic events or organizations that, you know, eventually implode on themselves and um, fail as an S&P 500 company or a large company. So, um, she talks about the um, underpinning and how all these high-performing organizations have high-performing teams and the great need of psychological safety on that team. You know, I went back and I thought to myself, okay, 25 years, with all the great studies and teams that I work with work on, you know, all these wonderful, brilliant clinicians, attorneys, right. I've worked on tons of agreements with contracts and lawyers and you know, IP negotiation with the IP people, et cetera. Um, but we we always worked it out. And even though it was hard, at the end of the day, it was a help each other culture. And I think that that is what is lost. Um, if you look at all the organizations across the United States, if not the world, only 20 to 30% of them report good engagement rates with their employees and the rest of them report uh, their employees are reporting a lot of stress at work and so it is really very detrimental to not only that organization okay. or that person the individual because mm-hmm. what the happiness research shows when stress goes up it fuels egocentrism like the the um tv show that you mentioned suits right. and when <laughs> stress goes up you are in survival mode You are fending for yourself and your knee-jerk reaction when you're in survival mode is is blame and shame and punish. So let let me ask you this. It's if you're in a stressful job, and I'm not saying what they do on suits is stressful, the law they do, it's mostly malpractice, frankly. Most of it doesn't make any sense to a lawyer. But setting all that aside, if you're in a stressful environment, say you're at a law firm and the law firm is doing litigation and there are deadlines and there's all these things happening and stress goes up. Uh, I mean, there's nothing you can do about that from the perspective of the work itself. In other words, what you have to do. You're still going to have the deadlines. You're still going to have opposing counsel on the other side of lawyers who might be jerks to you. It's pretty common, unfortunately, in the industry that, you know, lawyers are jerks to each other sometimes. I, I, I don't like that personally, but that's how it comes down. So how can, how, I guess, is how does that interface with the idea of having an empathetic workplace and lowering stress when really the job could be creating the stress itself, not the not the team, right? Talk that's, to me about that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So, 
Um, so the I got a medical nurse. So I have over 450 hours of certifications in okay. um, leadership, negotiation, um, happiness, mindfulness, and and I got so fascinated by the neuroscience behind resilience and stress um, that okay. I got a medical neuroscience certification. But in any event, so stress is how you respond. And I didn't understand that until now in my career. I wish I would have understood it before. So I kind of learned it that three years where I learned how to let go my ego. I accidentally learned the skills of stress reduction and resilience. Okay. So now that I've gone back and, uh, you know, when people were yelling at me, telling me I was wrong, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I had operations, people yelling at me, regulatory people yelling at me. I was resilient. And I actually yelling at you like, like shouting, yelling, or just kind of, well, yeah, sometimes I shouted. Sometimes wow. I was blamed and shamed in a room and said, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know what I was talking about. Yeah. That um, doesn't sound fun. That sounds like the Suits yeah. TV show. Yeah. Well, right. well, it happens. It happens in many workplaces. And so when people get triggered or they feel like they're right and you're wrong, stress goes up and empathy goes right. down. And unfortunately, human nature um, is, you know, punish, blame, and shame. And so it's part of our society or part of our culture. If somebody does something wrong, you punish them. In negotiation, I learned, you know, from, I don't know if you know Chris Voss. He is the FBI hostage negotiator and he gave okay. a second in this negotiation course, there was a, a big general with this, you know, big, you know, plaque of all these things talking about Shiite and Sunni negotiations. Um, right. So what's fascinating about extremely stressful negotiations, whether it's with you, your teammates, or another organization or a big deal that's very high profile and there's a lot of money at stake, the two most critical skills in negotiation our empathy and listening. And so what was fascinating about Chris Voss, um, the FBI hostage negotiator, he said, I had to negotiate with these murderer rapists, but I had to negotiate with them because I had to get those hostages out alive, right. including the murderer rapists. But he said that there's no way that if I pushed hard and I was tough, that I would ever get hostages out alive. Right. He described how he had to be empathic with these horrible people to get on some sort of common ground. And it doesn't mean that what they're doing is okay, but you're getting on some sort of a common ground to try to uncover some sort of creative solution or problem. Okay. And that's the thing about problem solving and high performing teams. You don't know where the solution is going to come from in a very complex situation. You don't know who's going to come up with it, where or when. And it's only in that team of an attorney, you know, a scientist, right. uh, a regulatory person. You know, it's a team of however, however many people. Sometimes these teams could be 10 people. Sometimes it could be 25 people. Sometimes they're multi-country um, but you don't know when or where that solution will come from. So, so tell me, Jackie, that. yeah, what is the secret to a high-performing team? So the secret ingredients to high-performing teams are, it's the collective mindful behavior of all the people on there, okay? okay. So let's say you have two parties and they're completely opposing. Okay. Their tensions are high and there's a lot of high stakes. And it's very stressful and it's very high profile. Well, one of those teams has to go for some sort of a win-win scenario. So if you think about game theory, if both parties go for win-lose, the risk is lose-lose. Everybody loses. Right. Ideally, both people are going to go for win-win. But if one, if your opposing side is going for win-lose and you actually go for win-win, you're actually avoiding and mitigating a lose-lose situation. So um, it's trying to uncover through empathy and help each other and collaboration. Mm -hmm. So the secret ingredients of high-performing teams are step one, stress reduction. You reduce okay. stress in the situation. 
And that high performing team through that, with that constant behavior of practicing stress reduction, which is a skill that can be trained and learned, you actually increase right. resilience of that team. You okay. are elevating the collective resilience of that team. Then happiness comes out. It's a high performing team. Now, what's ideal is, is that if both team, if both organizations could do that, I would love to see the first law firm that's the happiest law firm in the country, if not the world, and the most empathic. Because in the, in the negotiation course that I took, mm -hmm. they talked about awful, horrible, devastating situations. At the end of the day, the win was empathy and listening. Right. Well, I think, I mean... We try to do stuff like that at our firm, you know, honestly. So it's interesting because we're talking about, multi yeah, well, multiple situations, right? So you're talking mentor to mentee, so senior attorney to a junior attorney or peer relationships between two attorneys or attorney to paralegal or vice versa. Yeah. There are all yeah. of these eternal relationships, but what you're yeah. describing more so, what popped in my head was when we are on one side of a case and the lawyers are on the other side of the case. And very, I mean, we have no control over whether or not they're going to seek win-win. Exactly. No control over their stress. And I'll tell you, frankly, oftentimes there's nothing we can do about how they act or how they approach things or what, what our clients want or what their clients want. So there's so many factors that go into us. So, our, so we're talking first, I guess, about internal teams, right? Empathy for internal teams. Tell me, and I, I can see that. I, I, so give us some tools about creating, reducing stress and enhancing empathy in internal teams. What are the what are the kind of highlights of the, how would you recommend that people go about that? I mean, we do things like employee pizza day and like yeah. happy hours and, you know, yeah. we try to be seen, we try to spend time with each other, but what are, are there some tricks that like some things we just haven't, you know, that aren't typical? Yes, yes. Actually, what you just mentioned is is phenomenal. Okay, so- the longest running human development study is from Harvard, and huh. um, it's the longest running happiness study, actually. Okay. They follow these 400 and some undergraduates from Harvard for 80 years. They've been drawing their blood, scanning their brains when they could, interviewing their stresses if they had one. They followed another Boston cohort, Boston area cohort, um, to make sure, you know, it wasn't just Harvard graduates. And then... Uh, just a few years ago, they released their most significant findings of what is the single most important thing to human happiness. And they thought, is it IQ? Is it how much money you make? Is it your sexy job title? It was none is of that. saying they went to Harvard over and over again? It was no, friends. Just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was friends. It was friends. So your okay. pizza commercials that you do is actually quite meaningful. It contributes to that because it's that pro-sociality that contributes to friendships. There's neuroscience behind it. And then another one is when you're thinking about a team and you're elevating the collective mindful behavior, there's theory called high reliability organization. Okay. okay. So a high reliability organization is an organization that problem solves well, is mm -hmm. thriving, is high performing. Um, does continuous improvement, right? Everybody wants to be a high reliability organization. Um, right. But how do you get there? And it's, it is the collective mindful behavior of the group. It's not just, you know, one person being a leader or a great leadership team. It has to be the employees too. So right. you can actually cultivate and train stress reduction skills. One way is mindfulness. Um, so it's it's a bit strange to some people, but the data are emerging um, with mindfulness, and there's over 25,000 papers now. And I accidentally stumbled upon this in my leadership study in my happiness. Okay. Study. And so describe uh, mindfulness uh, for for our listeners. I, I'm I you know I have Headspace. I kind of have an idea about mindfulness from doing my little daily Headspace thing. But but let's jump into wonderful. that a little bit. Yeah, talk talk about my, uh, mindfulness. I think it's it's a really important concept to what you're explaining, and we kind of throw people bandy that term about sort of recklessly, right? But yes. what is it in the workplace? So in the workplace, uh, well, actually, the definition of mindfulness is awareness, paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally. So let's say somebody at work said something really insensitive. Let's say 
you're in litigation and the other side was just brutal and you're reading their document and you it just really just triggers you. Um, yeah. So when you get triggered, okay, this is the practice of mindfulness. You can actually shrink the amount of time that you're stressed and you can actually increase the resilience and there's real neuroscience behind it. Okay. So when you're in stress mode, there are very specific brain regions in your brain. It's called your default mode network. All your neural networks are going there. All your cerebral blood flow is going just to your default mode network. You're in stress mode and you're in survival mode. No one teaches us how to dampen that or turn that off. Another Harvard study by Matt Killingworth, different study, out of 2,250 people, we spend 50% of our waking hours mind wandering in this state and stress, worry, fear. And no one ever teaches okay. us to turn it off or dampen it. And mindfulness is one of them. So what happens is, is when you reduce stress, you're actually creating new neural networks in other brain regions where you want them. And that those are the brain regions of focus, paying attention on purpose. And the data show, if you do this just 10 or 15 minutes a day, the duration matters. You know, it's months, years out, but you right. will acquire these skills of resilience. So I'm two and a half years into practicing mindfulness. Somebody could shower bullets and scream at me. I can actually be kind and empathic. I've never been able to do that before. I wish I would have had this skill set years ago, but better late than never. Gotcha. So let's, I guess, final question for this. Have you ever heard of Ikigai, the Japanese Ikigai. concept of, yeah, the it, it's, it's, I read a book about it, like, I don't know, two couple months ago. I shared it with one of my friends, a tennis pro, and uh, he got into it too. But it's a, it, it's a book that, um, I can't remember, Garcia, I think was the author. I can't remember the author, but it's about, it's a Japanese concept that combines a live life, meaning, benefit, and worth into one concept. So that you're hitting all of these things at the same time. There's a village in Japan, an island where everybody lives to 120. I don't know. Oh anyway, gosh. it's an interesting concept. I throw it out. Maybe look into it. Maybe it kind of ties into this. Side note. So I have a sense now the secret sauce is empathy and it's mindfulness within the group uh, and stress reduction. That's the secret to high-performing teams. So And happiness. And ha so so does it, that's, that's the stuff you need to result in happiness. You need to get to happiness, right? Well, you can do it in parallel. So, you know, those pizza socials you talked about, it's part of yeah. it. There's actually happiness training. You can do little exercises, just like how mindfulness is a mental exercise. Okay. Happiness and resilience go hand in hand. Gotcha. So okay. when you're in stress mode, do anything and everything. Okay, I'm triggered. I am really upset right now. Right. I am going to go for a walk. I'm going to do deep breathing. But let's say later on that night, I'm really stressed and I really want to trigger positive emotion in my brain because when I trigger positive emotion in my brain, so if you can remember anything from today, it's the thoughts that flow through your mind, shape your brain. If you don't know how to turn off your stress or dampen it, right. it will havoc on your life and your body. Um, okay. so there's multiple ways to do stress reduction, but gratitude journaling, it works. I do it. I didn't believe it. I do it 10 minutes once a week. There's actually studies on these things. So when you gratitude journal for 10 minutes a week, you're thinking and reflecting upon and you're magnifying the good in your life. And when you're writing it out for 10 minutes, it's forcing you to think about the good in your life. And the more detailed you are, the better when you're writing about it. You're wow. strengthening neural networks okay. in the brain regions where you want them. And believe it or not, when you do this over time, over duration, it's easier to dampen stress and turn it off when you want. That's it. That's resilience. Gotcha. So, uh, Jackie, I'm going to ask you to come back in our next episode and give us three things, three simple points or four or two, however many number of things you want to give to our listeners, be they lawyers, business people, entrepreneurs, aspiring entrepreneurs, or just people who like listening to uh, your voice. Um, whatever they are. So so thank you for joining us for this episode. And folks, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Black Letter Podcast. Download us wherever you get your podcasts and join us in the next show when Jackie comes back to give us kind of her summary and highlights and things for you to remember. 
That's all for today's episode of Black Letter. Thanks again for listening. Join us next time when we talk about more Black Letter issues in creative ways. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode and check out our website at blackletterstudios.com.